Well, hello out there in YouTube land. Uh, winter has finally hit El Paso. So I was out running this morning and it was, oh gosh, it was like 50 degrees outside. I was out in my shorts, a light windbreaker. I was about eight miles from the truck out in the desert and then boom, the storm front hit. <laughs> and it's been very, very wet and cold and uh, freezing uh, on my run back. And uh, boy, oh boy, I'll tell you. <laughs> that was an adventure. Anyway, I am back because um, I had to get back early so I could discuss this book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. So three videos in, I'm finally on chapter one. So let's get into it. Um, as I said in the previous video, there is no introduction to this book. Uh, Balcom just dives right on in to chapter one. So I don't know. It's not made explicit who the intended reader of this book is, um, which I think is important because if Balcom is assuming that his readers will bring up front a premise that the uh, gospels, the gospel narratives are 100% factually, uh, historically correct, uh, even um, inspired by the Almighty, um, it's not going to have any um, argumentative weight if uh, to a person like Bart Ehrman. And that's important because I started this book discussion because critics of Bart Ehrman are saying that he must address the arguments in this book, in this book of critical scholarship. Well, it may be a book of critical scholarship, but if Bart Ehrman doesn't, you know, initially agree with those uh, premises the same premises that Richard Balcom does right up front. And if Balcom is going to present arguments based on those premises that are not agreed upon between, you know, a, 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 a skeptic like uh, Bar Ehrman and a person like Richard Balcom, well, you know, how, how much argumentative weight is it really going to have? You know, maybe there's a reason he's not addressing this book and his critics are just making a lot of noise. I don't know. So I don't know. It, it seems to me that's a bit of an issue. But hey, I'm not afraid. I've got, let's just do it. So chapter one is pretty short. I should be able to cover it in this video. Chapter one, um, from the historical Jesus to the Jesus of testimony. So Richard Balcom uh, says that you know, for the first, you know, millennia and a half of, of, the, uh, of Christian history, people by and large took for granted that the Gospels were uh, historically uh, accurate and that they were written by the uh, traditional authors that are ascribed to the Gospels. No problems. And then, sometime around the era, early 19th century, primarily in uh, Europe, there came about a bunch of scholars who started to critically assess the Gospels and uh, decide that they are not 100% factually correct. In fact, there are many errors in history. There are many contradictions, many um, etc. There's a lot of red flags, let's put it that way, in the Gospels that lead them to believe that if we are to remain Christians, we have to find the historical Jesus as opposed to the Christ of faith. And um, so then began all of these different, what are called quests of the historical Jesus, these scholarly movements that tried to whittle away the uh, myth and legend of the Gospels and find the, uh, the historical person of Jesus laying somewhere underneath. Well, Richard Balcom I mean, comes up front and says, this is a big problem. One of the biggest problems is that the very term itself, historical Jesus, is very ambiguous. So he uh, comes up with three different um, ideas of what that term historical Jesus means. Um, the first definition he comes up with is, is 
separating the earthly Jesus from the heavenly Christ. Uh, that could be what the historical Jesus means. But in order to do this, Balcom says, um, the critic must, uh, <laughs> must know everything that there is to know about the life of Jesus on earth. And there's no way to do that because, after all, uh, as the Gospel of John says, uh, the uh, world itself cannot contain, cannot contain the, uh, all of the books that we would be needed to, uh, to record everything Je Jesus did on earth. Um, that seems to me, I mean, even without the, uh, the bit from the Gospel of John, that seems to me to be a bit preposterous. I mean, if that's the definition, I don't know of anybody that uses that definition of the historical Jesus, but even if somebody wanted to use that kind of a definition, I mean, it, it wouldn't apply to anybody. You can't find the historical life of anybody that you wanted to do a historical um, uh, analysis of because you can never know everything about anybody. That that just seems ridiculous. Um, whatever. So, Balcom's next um, definition of historical Jesus is a Jesus that is found in the Gospels underneath the accretions of supposed legends and myths. Um, this is what I understand the historical Jesus to mean. Um, but Balcom says there's a big problem with this. Why? Well, because, you know, all of these scholars for the last couple of centuries who have undertaken this quest of the historical Jesus can't agree on any standard methodology of interpretation. How do you go about finding the historical Jesus? Everybody seems to cook up a different Jesus when they try doing it. Um, I, th I think this is what most scholars mean by the historical Jesus. And, um, hey, it keeps them employed. So <laughs> they keep doing it, I guess. Um, well, there is a third way, uh, Balcom says, uh, a third way. And uh, wouldn't you know it, it's uh, using the Gospels as testimony. And I don't think he comes right out and says it, but I think he just means... Let's just go back to the traditional way that has been always been done, and let's just take the Gospels as they're written and call that history. Um, okay, so um, let's see. So on the on the bottom of page four, here's what Balcom has to say about this third approach that he is proposing. Must history and theology part company at this point? where Christian faith's investment in history is at its most vital? Must we settle for trusting the Gospels for our access to the Jesus in whom Christians believe, while leaving the historians to construct a historical Jesus based only on what they can verify for themselves by critical historical methods? I think there is a better way forward a way in which theology and history may meet in the historical Jesus, instead of parting company there. In this book, I am making a first attempt to lay out some of the evidence and methods for it. Its key category is testimony. So there you have it. This is the paragraph that kind of, that kind of convinces me that, yes, he is writing to fellow Christians because he's saying, must we settle for trusting the Gospels um, to, to historians um, and letting them tell us what to believe, things like that. So I think he's addressing this book to fellow be believers. So there you have it. The, this whole book is going to be uh, <laughs> uh, arguing that um, instead of using traditional methods of trying to figure out who the historical Jesus is, we're just going to do it the way we've always done it. We're going to trust the Gospels as history. And you know what? We don't need to take that on faith because he because he's going to argue that the Gospels were indeed written by eyewitness testimony or at least based on that. So there you go. There's his... Uh, 
There's Richard Balcom's method for determining the historical Jesus. Okay. Uh, Balcom begins by stating his assumptions up front. So on page 7, uh, Balcom has this to say. The Gospels were written within living memory of the events they recount. Mark's Gospel was written well within the lifetime of many of the eyewitnesses, while the other three canonical Gospels were written in the period when living eyewitnesses were becoming scarce, exactly at the point in time when their testimony would perish with them, were it not put in writing. This is a highly significant fact entailed not by unusually early datings of the Gospels, but by the generally accepted ones. Okay, great. So, I'm reading this bit from page 7 because this is Balcom's starting premise, that the Gospels were written within living memory of the events that they are describing. Um, and he's saying that this is a mainstream view. He's not going crazy and saying that they were written weeks after the life of Jesus. Um, so it's, it's certainly plausible, um, it's conceivable that they were based on the eyewitness testimony of, of people who observed those events of Jesus' life. So that's his starting premise. There's no argument there at all. There's nothing to argue that that is the case. It's a blanket statement. It's, an, it's, it's a premise. And so, again, if you're not going to accept that premise, if you have a different, for instance, evidence or a historical idea or reason for thinking that the Gospels were written, let's say, in the second century, a hundred years after the lifetime of Jesus, um, well after anybody who could have witnessed those events are long dead, um, well, chances are you may not accept the arguments that Richard Balcom has to present. That's a starting premise. It's not a, he's not going to argue for that case that they are early. They're early. Boom, done. We're going to use that as a premise and move forward and base our arguments partly on that foundation. So again, I don't, I'm not sure that somebody like Bart Ehrman is going to find the arguments in this book useful based on premises like that. Well, it is an unsupported statement, the fact that the Gospels were written at that time. Uh, Balcom assumes that his readers will accept this, and that the evangelists, that is the writers of the Gospels, lived within the lifetime of the original witnesses. Okay, well, I can only speak for myself. I do not take that those Gospels were written at that time period as an obvious fact. Um, so I, I have my reasoning, which I don't need to get into here. No argument was made, so I don't need to defend my argument. Um, it's just a premise that already up front, we're not speaking the same language. We're not agreeing on the same premises. Okay. Um, Richard Balcom uh, ends chapter one by acknowledging the work of Samuel, I'm, I know I'm mispronouncing this, but Samuel Byerskog, um, B-Y-R-S-K-O-G, uh, in his book, Story as History, History as Story. So, apparently, this is a book that I've never heard of, or a scholar I've never heard of, but Richard Balcom is, say, is, is basing a lot of his book on the work of this uh, earlier scholar, Samuel Byerskog. Well, Samuel Byerskog talks about some of the ancient historians uh, of antiquity that also used eyewitness testimony. People like uh, Thucy Thucydides, Polybius, Josephus, and Tacitus that they that they all of these ancient historians were convinced that their histories were only reliable if they were based on eyewitness testimony. Um, here's what he has to say on page eight. The ancient historians were convinced that true history could be written only while events were still within living memory. <laughs> 
and they valued as their sources the oral reports of direct experience of the events by involved participants in them ideally the historian himself should have been our should have been a participant in the events he narrates as for example xenophon thucydides and josephus were but since he could not have been at all the events he recounts or in all the places he describes the historian had also to rely on eyewitnesses whose living voices he could hear and whom he could him question himself autopsy that is eyewitness testimony was the essential means to reach back into the past um, my response is whoa simply uh not true uh <laughs> um you know they may have relied on eyewitness accounts of 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 events that happened during their lifetimes for instance thucydides was certainly alive during the time of the events that he wrote about things like that i mean but come on i mean that's think about somebody like josephus who is also mentioned in this paragraph um i've read large portions of of, of his histories and he certainly writes about events of uh, the the Jewish wars uh, in the early years of the uh, Christian era. But, I mean, he also uh, writes volumes and volumes and volumes of, of events uh, that happened uh, allegedly <laughs> centuries, even millennia, before he ever lived. Um, so they relied on, on written sources like what we would call the old testament they relied on that too certainly not everything they wrote about came from eyewitness testimony and you know they wrote about their own gods and deities too um so i don't know just to say that these ancient historians valued eyewitness testimony above all else uh you know i'm no, i'm no expert on ancient historians but i i i really don't think that's true um and that's pretty much it for uh chapter one um oh wait there's one other thing i want to write i want to i want to mention here before this video ends um on page 11 uh the last chapter or sorry the last page of this chapter um as i said buyer skog and richard balcom also seem to Put a lot of weight on the fact that a lot of these ancient historians only relied on <laughs> eyewitness testimony when they wrote their histories so as a as a consequence of that if the gospel writers were also writing history it just stands to reason that they also must have relied on eyewitness testimony um, here's what they have to say on page 10 and 11. The ancient historians knew that first-hand insider testimony gave access to truth that could not be had otherwise. Though not uncritical, they were willing to trust their eyewitness informants for the sake of the unique access they gave to the truth of the events. Um, okay, he's... He, uh, they're referring to the gospel writers at this point. So my question is, how does um, Richard Balcom know that the gospel writers trusted their eyewitness sources, although they were critical of them? He says they were not uncritical. Um, that's, that's just an assertion. I don't see how you can read the Gospels, any four of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And even if they were written uh, based uh, on eyewitness testimony, uh, how you can determine whether they were critical or not of the sources they relied on. How can you possibly tell? I mean, you could tell if they did something like this. If they said, um, for instance, if Matthew the evangelist wrote something like um, I Matthew am writing about what I what an eyewitness said that Jesus said um, 
he, he gave this parable and he gave that parable. Let's just say. But um, another source, eyewitness source, said that he gave another parable. That, and it just so happens that those two parables have contradictory uh, ideas or contradictory um, uh, points that are being made. So which one is more accurate? Well, maybe this one over that one. That would be a, at least some kind of idea that they're that the evangelist is making a critical assessment of his sources. But there's there that's how you tell. But there's simply no hint of that in the Gospels. So you know when Baucom just writes stuff like that, it, it's a red flag. That's just the best way I can say it. It's like, these are just assertions. What do you mean by being critical or uncritical of your sources? And how do you tell? What's your methodology? What are you basing this on? Okay, anyway. Um, that's a red flag. Um, <laughs> so there you go. Um, all right, I guess next time I'll start on chapter two. From here on, the chapters are going to get pretty lengthy. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to break these up. So um, I don't know. We'll just go from there. All right, take care.